Our trip started in late February as my three friends, John, Steve, Max, and I drove my truck deep into the backwoods of Boxwood Gulch to follow the North Fork of the South Pallet River. Steve actually owned a cabin up in the backcountry, so we left my truck there and began our 57-mile hike into the wooded terrain following the river. We all had our camping and fishing gear packed, and enough food to hopefully last us the three-day journey both ways. The pre-spawn bass wouldn't be an easy catch since we reached the hole, but if we were going to endure this brutal cold, we wouldn't go home without a fight. As we first set out into the early morning, a few light snowflakes began to fall. The terrain was heavily wooded and uneven, making for slow going. But the cool mountain air rustled through the trees and the sunlight streamed through the canopy, making the snowflakes glint and shimmer as birds chirped overhead. It was going to be a near-perfect trip. We stopped for a quick rest a few hours in. The weather had been slowly worsening since we had left, but it was only then that we realized how bad it had really gotten. The snow was whipping us around in a blinding flurry as the wind howled. The crooked, mangled trees creaked and swayed violently, almost threatening to snap in two. The ground had already accumulated a good six inches of snow. It was about midday, but the sky was black. And I don't mean dark due to the entering, intensifying storm. I mean that in between the gaps in the clouds, there was no blue, just solid black. None of us really made a note of it at the time, as it was hard to notice through the thick cascade of snow and the limited visibility. After continuing our hike for some time, it became all too apparent that something was wrong. In addition to the sky, we also realized that there was nothing in the distance. There should have been some mountains or something like that up there, but no matter which way we turned, the world only seemed to extend 50 or so feet around us. Then it disappeared into the blizzard. It was nighttime now, or at least it was dark out. My watch, however, read two in the afternoon. As we walked forward, new things slowly came into view, but everything behind us disappeared. And although we could progress further, We couldn't seem to double back. Once we left something behind us, we couldn't reach it again. Steve had forgotten his lighter a little while back when we stopped to eat, but when we tried to turn around and go back, we were greeted by a wall of snow and fog impossible to see through. Curious, Steve slowly reached out and moved his hand into the fog. First his fingertips disappeared, then his whole hand vanished into the haze. We all stood in disbelief, looking at the wall which was impossibly tall and extended as far as we could see. There was no real gradient to it. Things didn't fade into the distance, there was a clear line where the wall began. And nothing was visible beyond that point. We were making a note of all this when Steve muttered something. What is it? I asked. I, 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 he stammered. I, I, I can't, I can't feel my hand. He said this slowly as if he was realizing it as he said it. Puzzled, he retracted his hand slowly and, and then screamed. His glove was shredded, almost disintegrated, and his hand looked like it had been forced through a wood chipper. Deep gashes revealed white bone underneath, and what fingers he had left were stripped clean. We all panicked. Oh my god, oh my god, oh my god, this is, this is bad, Max cried. Steve simply stood, clutching what was left of his hand and hyperventilating. 
We had to get him to a hospital or he would certainly bleed to death. But we were almost a day's walk from Steve's cabin, which was already remote enough. We were all frantically checking our phones for a signal when the worst happened. Steve fainted. His eyes closed. His, his legs buckled. And he fell forward. Into the fog. None of us noticed at first, but when we finally did, all we can see were his legs protruding from the mist. We immediately, without thinking, rushed to pull him out. We grabbed his legs and strained to drag him back into view. Before we even saw him, however, we immediately regretted doing so. We somehow knew what we would find. The thing we dragged out was not Steve. Not anymore. All of his skin was cleaved off. His ribcage open and his entrails spilling out. And his face instantly burned into my vision, becoming an after image that haunts me to this very day. Not merely because it was horrendously mutilated, not merely because his eyes had been torn out leaving only empty sockets, but because it smiled at me. A, a big, wide smile that started small, but then the gashes in his face allowed it to literally stretch from ear to ear. Max screamed and shoved Steve's mangled body back into the fog. We ran as fast as we could, the only way we could, deeper into the woods. Just as before, the snow and fog parted before us, but swallowed up everything we left behind. As we ran and ran, the scenery around us began to slowly change. The trees surrounding us were now withered and dead, and the grass was flattened and bleached white. In fact, everything around us was lifeless and dull. Colors had all but disappeared, leaving only shades of gray and an intensified feeling of loneliness and death. Guys, I shouted while I ran, not daring to stop even for a minute. We can't turn around and we can't go straight back, but maybe we can circle back around to Steve's cabin. Th then we can get to the truck and get the hell out of here. John and Max nodded their heads and we turned 90 degrees right and continued running. Eventually, we ran through what appeared to be a herd of deer, all which were laying on the ground, gray and lifeless, hacked to pieces, blood soaked the snow-covered ground. As we ran through the herd, dodging corpses, it was hard not to notice that their dead, lifeless eyes seemed to follow us. When we felt confident enough that we wouldn't be doubling back on ourselves, we turned towards Steve's cabin, towards safety. We ran for at least another hour. Eventually, however, none of us could run any longer. Our bodies just simply wouldn't allow it, and we were forced to stop. After some time, Max, John, and I managed to get a fire going, despite the snow and damp tinder. We had hoped it would bring some sense of warmth and security, but we were wrong. The flames were a bright orange hue, bleeding some color into this grayscale world. It clearly did not belong, nor did we. The longer the flames crackled and popped, the more we began to hear something. Distant and, and quiet at first, but slowly growing closer, louder, and more numerous. A chorus of blood-curdling wails and moans soon filled the stagnant air around us. Focused on the fire and pretending to be safe, mesmerized by its beauty, we didn't immediately notice the mangled deer carcass slowly dragging itself out of the fog and into the view. Nor did we notice the second, nor third. Finally, we snapped out of our trance just in time to scramble to our feet in terror as a myriad of different animal carcasses clamored out of the fog, drawn to the strange light of the fire. 
We were intruders in their world. I was paralyzed by fear, unable to breathe. The corpses moved in a surreal and broken haphazard toss of limbs. As if they were poorly animated puppets. I turned to my friends to find that they were no longer beside me. They had taken off running, leaving me behind. I turned around to run after them, but something grabbed me by the shoulder. I didn't need to turn around to know what it was. I can tell by the hand gripping my shoulder. A hand looked as though it had gone through a wood chipper. I flailed and managed to free myself before it could get a good grip on me and took off running. I didn't look back. No way did I want to see that face that was once my friend. I could no longer see John or Max, and I assumed they must have been ahead of me. But I was the one with the keys to the truck, and Steve had the keys to the cabin. They wouldn't be any safer if I couldn't meet up with them. So I ran. And I ran faster, and for longer than any human could possibly do under a normal circumstance. Finally, after God knows how long, I can faintly make out a structure in the distance. It was the cabin. I felt a twinge of hope. The wails continued to ring out in the night air. But I seemed to have a lead on them at the time. I reached the truck, unlocked it, and jumped inside. I scanned the area for Max or John, but I could see neither. I, I couldn't just leave them, but I couldn't wait longer either. I sat sweating and shaking nervously as the wails grew closer and louder, I had just about made up my mind to leave them when I suddenly could make out them sprinting towards me. Well, it looked like Max. I started up the truck and motioned for him to run faster. But for some reason, I found myself subconsciously pressing the switch to my left, locking the doors. My instinct told me that something was wrong. I looked down at my hands were shaking like crazy. I looked back up and Max's horribly mutilated face was pressed up against the driver's side window, staring at me, smiling. He was trying to open the door. I slammed my foot on the gas and drove off, shaking like a madman and holding back my vomit. As I drove home, the sky slowly brightened back up to blue and I could eventually see the sun breaking through the clouds. It was nine in the morning. I began to see other cars on the road, and the people inside waved at me as I waved at them. Nice, normal people. I went straight home, and I asked my girlfriend to marry me. I'm sorry, that's just not true. I'm sitting in my house now, doors locked and barricaded, windows boarded up, and I'm writing the story. And I felt happy for the first time in a long time writing that ending. I hardly even remember what blue sky looks like, but I just wanted to picture it in my mind one last time. I just needed to imagine a happier world because in reality, that's not how it ended. The truth is, as I drove, the sky did not brighten up, the sun did not reappear, and the fog still surrounded me as it now surrounds my house. I hear wailing all around and knocks at my door constantly, and when I look through the peephole, all I ever see is something smiling at me. The stench of death is everywhere. The phone doesn't work. The TV and radio broadcast nothing but static. I hear the locks on my door being undone at night, and I must constantly keep watch and relock them. I'm simply waiting for the night that they get into my house when I forget to check the door, or when they break through a window, or when I wake up in the middle of the night to see them next to me. Their smiles inches away from my face.
I hope you ghouls are enjoying these uh, state-specific creepy pastas. This one was Colorado. I hope you liked it. It was a little creepy. Kind of reminded me, you know, of like the mist, the fog, those kind of movies. But oh my god, like what the what would you do? I was just imagining it while I was reading it and narrating it. Like if you like put your hand in a thing and it's just gone, you pull it out and it's just ripped to shreds. All you see is like your bone of the fingers and stuff creepy i couldn't even and when he fell all the way in and they pulled him out i was just like envisioning this mutilated thing just coming out and you just being like no no and then just pushing it back in but i really like this one it was really interesting a little bit different so i hope you ghouls enjoyed it and i hope you ghouls are also looking forward to monday's killer ladies episode i found this really awesome female serial killer and i i hope you ghouls enjoy it uh, yeah, so that's it. As always, the last video will be on the top left. The next video will be on the bottom left. All my social medias are on the screen, as well as in the description box below. And as always, there's always someone or something watching you. <laughs>